Good morning guys, welcome to Sunday morning art chat. All right, first things first, I gave myself a haircut. I woke up feeling extra shaggy yesterday morning and uh, so I just got out the clippers and the scissors and I gave it a go. Uh, it wasn't as bad as I thought it'd be. It was definitely messy. Uh, I did it in the bathroom, I laid out a towel and just went for it. But uh, if you're wondering what to do about a haircut, I'd say cut your own hair, give it a shot. It wasn't as hard as I thought. Tilda asks, can I reuse old canvases with oil paint? She's got some canvases that are about 10 years old and they have thin, a thin layer of oil paint on them. And the answer is yes. Uh, lots of artists will paint over old oil paintings with oil paint. You don't want to paint over an old oil painting with acrylic paint. Although you can do the opposite. You can paint oil paintings. You can do an oil painting on top of an old acrylic painting, um, but not vice versa. So, uh, and the reason for that is different uh, drying rates and flexibility in the paints. I won't get into that here, but yes, you can definitely paint over your old painting. And what I do is when I'm gonna paint over an old panel is I'll give it a light sanding to uh, knock down some of the brushwork and then, um, and when I'm sanding it, I'm careful to vacuum up. I'll take a shop vac and then I'll vacuum up the dust while I'm sanding just because there's, you know, there could potentially be titanium or cadmium in that dust. So you want to be careful about that. Wear a dust mask and like I say, vacuum it up right away. Um, let's see. And also too, the other thing about painting over an old painting is the image can be distracting. So what I usually do is I will flip it upside down. Uh, that helps me. I've gotten used to it because I've done in so many of them that now painting over an old image um, doesn't really bother me. And I kind of like leaving the old image because I get little pops of color at random places uh, that you know, that oftentimes are really interesting. So painting over old paintings can be really cool. Um, if you are distracted by the image, you could, you know, go over it with like say an oil primer or like a white or gray paint, uh, oil paint to kind of knock down the image or kind of obscure the image so that you're not distracted. Um, so the one thing you don't want to do though, again, you don't want to go over that old painting with an acrylic primer, uh, like an acrylic gesso don't want to do that. Um, you'd want to use an oil primer or just maybe some like oil paint, like I say, gray or white or whatever color you want to kind of knock down that image. All right. Pierre asks, uh, how did you learn to paint faces? Uh, I think with faces, I approach painting faces the same way I approach any subject, which is squinting at it and trying to focus on the shapes you know, get those shapes in place and then come in and refine them until it looks right. I think the thing with faces is they just take longer. Occasionally I'll get lucky and I will get a likeness like immediately, which, you know, and then other times it takes me forever to get, you know, I'll labor over it until I get the face to look right. Sometimes it's hard to just even to get the face to look human or to look like, not like a cartoon or something. So, um, and that, I find that it's typically harder to paint small faces, which makes sense because even on like a life-size face, the smallest change, uh, the smallest brushstroke can change the expression on the face. So it's just, I think our eyes or our minds are trained to read faces and very subtle variations in like, you know, mood. Like, is that person hating on me right now? <laughs> like things like that were very, I think we probably look at faces closer than just about anything. So you've got to get it right. And uh, so it's definitely difficult. The thing I'd say is practice as much as possible. Stick with it. Um, most people who are, who are good at it, just, they just don't give up until they get it right, regardless of how long it takes. That's the key. Just don't give up. I've found that sometimes when I'm painting a face, I'll think, it just looks horrible and I'll make maybe a few minor changes and then it works. So <laughs> the difference between working and not working at all can be a very minor change. So just keep with it and be tenacious. Don't give up. All right. Sonoma wine tour drivers asks, I want to paint for a living. How does one begin? I think the path to becoming a professional painter is different for every artist. 
And I've said repeatedly that if you're gonna be a professional painter, you're gonna to have to be as creative about how you sell your work as you do in creating your work. Um, so I think the thing I've learned is to um, be resourceful and look at the opportunities that are available at any given time. Because your journey is not gonna be, it's gonna be one of just taking steps, um, little steps, and then you're gonna go on a journey that you wouldn't have predicted. Um, I, uh, when I first decided to be professional or, or want to be a professional painter, I basically had no idea how to do it. Um, and it was kind of discouraging, um, and almost gave up on the idea. And then I just started saying, all right, well, I'm just going to take any opportunity that presents itself. And at first that was like community shows. And I had some churches contact me and ask me if I wanted to do shows at their in, in their um, in their churches actually, which uh, which was really good experience because it allowed me to um, go through the process of putting together a show. In other words, framing and varnishing and signing and photographing the work and the whole deal. Um, so that when I did end, end up working with a gallery and had my own my first solo show, I had already had several solo shows in community related um, venues, and that 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 was really invaluable. So I'd say look at this stuff, look at the opportunities that present themselves, take advantage of any opportunity, whether it's a cafe or a library or whatever, to get your work out in front of people and be patient. It takes a long time. The other thing to do is also find ways using like say social media or online. Um, I think Instagram is a really great way to reach people um, and to build an audience. And um, uh, in fact, most of my sales for the first, my first sales were all online. I had a blog kind of like, um, you know, daily, what's that guy's name? Um, uh, Dwayne Kaiser. He used to have a, like a painting a day kind of thing where he'd paint a six by six or a five by seven or something every day and then sell it on eBay. I just copied that and did that for probably two years, sold a bunch of paintings on there. That gave me confidence to start, you know, approaching galleries. If they're buying it from me online, you know, why wouldn't they buy it in a gallery? So yeah, you want to focus on trying to reach people and sell paintings to, you know, to people yourself first. Uh, and also too, even when you are selling in galleries, selling directly to people is still going to need to be a part of what you do. So um, I'd say that's the first area to focus on. So online and community shows, that sort of thing. Uh, and then again, just stick with it and constantly be thinking of ways of getting your work out in the public and, and making it available to people. So best of luck with that. Uh, Daya asks, do you always use the same brushes for plein air? I do now, like I've gotten to the point where I use mostly brights and flats in like say number six and number 10 sizes. Uh, I could use, yeah, for plein air, that's about the sizes I use. And most of them are, they're synthetic. Uh, although occasionally I'll use natural bristle. When I first started out, I was using Utrecht 209 flats. They're inexpensive, um, and I'd heard there's a lot of painters that use those. Um, you know, a lot of uh, professional painters were using them, and I kept hearing that name come up. Those are very inexpensive. Those are good brushes. They kind of vary in quality, so it's good to go into the store if you've got a Blick around you. They carry them at Blick, um, because then you can go out in and pick out the brushes. Um, although when I've ordered online, they've all been fine. But it is kind of nice to pick your own brushes, especially with inexpensive ones because there tends to be, you know, they vary in quality. You can find one that's like, wow, that looks great. And another one that's all kind of wonky. But um, with the Utrecht 209, I'd say the quality is pretty good. So yeah, I'm at the point now where basically those are the brushes that I use. Uh, if somebody gave me like a round or a filbert, I'd use it. But um, I find that flats and brights are you know, they get most of the work done. Uh, in the studio, occasionally I'll use like a number two liner or rigger or number four for little details. Um, if I'm painting a cityscape uh, plein air, then I'll bring along a small brush like that too, just to, for little things like, you know, uh, light on cars, like pops of light on the hoods of cars, etc. But if I'm painting a landscape, I never use a small brush like that. All right, Kervalin asks, uh, when the light changes, do you change your painting or do you stick with the original lighting idea? I try to stick with the original lighting idea. Uh, when I show up at a scene, 
you know, usually what I do is I'll walk around with my viewfinder until I, you know, get a compositional idea, which is usually based on light and shadow if the sun is shining. Um, and so uh, if it's an overcast day, then the lighting is not going to change typically, unless the overcast burns off and it gets sunny. Um, which usually doesn't happen. It's more often than not what will happen is I'll start painting and fog will roll in or clouds will come in. And then what I try to do is um, stick with the original idea. So like I said, when I show up, if there's a nice shadow pattern, I will lock that in immediately using alizarin crimson, a mixture of alizarin crimson and ultramarine blue to create this kind of transparent purple that you guys have probably seen me do in plenty of my plein air paintings. That's kind of how I start. And, uh, and then, then I've got the shadows locked in. So if the light changes, um, you know, the light and shadow is still, I know what, you know, I know what it originally looked like, what originally inspired me. And then I stick with that. And oftentimes I'll try to finish it from memory, uh, which, you know, I paint fairly quickly. So most of my plein air paintings are done within like say an hour to two hours. So it's not really a problem to remember what the colors are like. Um, and so I, I usually will do that. Now, if the lighting improves, like in other words, if I'm painting and all of a sudden there's a lighting effect that I really like, um, I might, I would add that to the painting. Um, usually, it, usually that kind of thing where there's a subtle improvement in the lighting um, is not so drastic that, that you can't incorporate it. Um, the most drastic is when a cloud comes over or when fog rolls in, then you're just dealing with something completely different. One thing I will say that's nice, actually, if the fog rolls in at the end of a painting, it can be really beneficial because at a certain point in the painting, you've got to almost take your eyes off the subject and just focus on the work itself and make sure that it's working as a painting. So if the fog rolls in and I'm almost done, I'll walk away, get my eyes off of it, and then I'll come back to it and I'll just ignore the subject and I'll just work on it as a painting. And the light, you know, like painting an overcast light is perfect. So I can make, you know, adjustments and, uh, and so oftentimes I'll do that. So it's kind of in some ways, like I say, it's kind of ideal if you're like painting and then at the very end fog comes in and now you can just do your touch-ups. Uh, and that does happen occasionally. But yeah, to answer your question, typically I stick with the original idea and, uh, you know, I'd say nine times, nine times out of 10. Okay. Uh, let's see here. What else? All right. Kathy asks, do you find that in our online world, it's hard to present your paintings in the best possible way? Yes. I mean, there are definite challenges to showing your work online. Uh, I think the benefits outweigh the downside for sure, because it's just amazing to be able to reach so many people. Um, but yeah, there are a lot of challenges. I mean, I'd say the biggest one is like when you're taking something, like say you have a three foot by three foot painting and then you're, you know, you're taking an image and putting it on Instagram where people are going to be viewing it this small. It's impossible to get a real accurate feel of what that painting looks like in real life. In fact, you know, it could be kind of loose, uh, you know, in real life. And then when it's shrunken down, it looks tight and detailed. Um, and also, so you're not really getting to see that brushwork and, um, you know, ideally paintings are meant to be seen in person. So, um, there's a big difference between, uh, the digital image and the real tangible object. So, but I do find that, that it's still worth it because it's a great way to get people maybe to come to a show or to come to see your work in person. Um, one thing that I have found that's, that the kind of makes me nervous or not so much anymore, but it used to was when I would sell a piece off say Instagram or my website or whatever. Um, I was always nervous that if the person got the painting in real life, that they were going to be disappointed or it wasn't going to be quite what they, they thought. But I would say every time so far, and I've sold a lot of paintings in that way, probably over a hundred, uh, I would say. And every time it made me nervous sending it off. Like, I hope they like it. And I would always check back with the person and say, want to make sure that it arrives safely and that you're happy with the work. And, um, invariably people were 
happier with it than they were with the image, which is always a relief. So I always tell myself now, like they're gonna like it better when they get it in person. But like I said, overall, I think that, you know, the ability to reach people through like social media and through like website and that sort of thing is really, it's really great. So it's, it's worth whatever challenges we deal with. Jacques and Martin ask uh, if I would answer some questions about liquid. I'll keep this short because uh, I'll probably do a video like more deep diving into the use of Liquin. But as you guys know, I use Liquin when I paint on location. Liquin is a fast drying medium from, from Windsor and Newton. It's sort of in a gel form. And uh, then but when you mix it up or you mix it into your paint, it com becomes very liquidy. Um, and it helps you to uh, extend the paint, to thin it down and apply it a lot faster. You get really nice coverage with Liquin. So it does allow me to paint quickly. Uh, it also creates a really durable paint film, um, which I like if I'm thinning paint and I'm applying it to a panel. I wanna mix in a little bit of liquid because if I just use mineral spirits for that first layer, uh, the mineral spirits is breaking down the binder. The binder is the oil that's in the paint that's holding together the color particles. If you compromise that binder too much, then there's that potential of having it scratch off of the panel. Uh, as you guys know, or you may know, I put pumice into my, um, a little bit of pumice into my uh, third layer of gesso on my panels, which allows the paint to absorb in a little bit. So I feel like there's gonna be a little bit better adhesion because of that absorbency but I still like to put a little bit of liquid in there in that first layer to make sure I got a really good foundation, that I've got a really good adhesion of paint to panel. Um, if you're painting on a canvas, typically they're gonna be absorbent, so those first layers will soak in. So if I'm painting on canvas, I won't use liquid at all sometimes, even if I'm painting outdoors, but if I'm painting on panels, I do use it. Um, and how do I use it? So in the beginning, I will use quite a bit of it for that first layer, and then I just use progressively less and less. So it, it, to the point where at the end, the painting is almost just, you know, it's almost paint out, straight out of the tube. And I use, um, uh, well, not straight out of the tube, just but just a little bit of liquid to loosen it up, but keep it still. Um, stiff enough that I can get some thick paint application. If you use too much, it's just gonna, f it, it, it becomes too liquidy and it just flattens out and you lose all the brushwork. So that's kind of the short story on it. Uh, yeah, the, the, the things that are challenging about liquid is it smells really toxic. So if I use it indoors, which I will use it occasionally indoors just for quick touch-ups. If you're painting a large painting, you know, you're gonna get that sort of off gassing or whatever, you know, it's gonna be radiating uh, fumes. Um, so that's not such a great thing to do indoors. I like, so I never do that. I'll do it some, some, sometimes out in my studio, which is a big space and I'll put a fan on. So I've used it out there, but in a, sm in a small space, unless you've got really good ventilation, I don't recommend it. Um, but yeah, liquid's great, very handy. And then it dries, typically for me, a painting will dry in about, a day or a day and a half so it really does accelerate the drying process and um, that can be nice if you want if you've got like a painting that's got to go out to a gallery or wherever and you know and you don't have a lot of time uh, what I'll do is I will I'll definitely paint with liquid um, so that I can work uh, you know I can like touch it up in a day or two with liquid again and then it you know can go out the door so um, the other thing I'd say that I do, sometimes if I do a painting, like a smaller painting on location, um, or any painting on location where I use liquid, I'll do my touch-ups outside. I'll just set up my plenary easel, and then I'll clean it up just, you know, outdoors so that I can use the liquid, because I like to stick with the medium that I started the painting with. Anyway, that's actually more about liquid than I thought I would get into. All right, that's it for this batch of questions. I have more, so I'm gonna do another video um, and that will be coming up soon. So thanks for hanging out, guys. Let me know if you have more questions, put them down below and I will see you in the next video.